My guest today is Devin Turnbull. His company is OJAS. Well, he is an entrepreneur. He, he is based here in Brooklyn. He builds things here in Brooklyn. But he started out as a DJ. He has been a men's fashion designer. But he is, he is one of us. He has built pro sound custom installations here in the US, in Japan, in Hong Kong. And I, I keep hearing, I keep hearing his name. I said, I got, I, I got to talk to this guy. So finally, it all came together. I went over to his, his beautiful home and I hung with him for a few hours and I listened to his sound and it was really, really impressive. Really impressive. It, it, there's something really going on here. So anyway, he's into horns, as you can plainly see. And just looking around his listening room, and well, everywhere I looked, it was one cool thing after another. It's a collection of cartridges, for example. Anyway, so much cool stuff and so much to talk about. Uh, but, you know, he sees, it's interesting, he sees himself as an outlier. Uh, and I guess he is. But I think he is sort of the template for what the future high-end audio entrepreneur will be. Something along the lines of what he's doing. I see that that's where this is all going. So I used to go to um, this uh, store in Akihabara called Hino Audio. Um, they had four or five storefronts on one street along a river in Akihabara. And uh, it was a great place. I'm very sad it's gone, but they had like a, uh, they had one storefront dedicated to, I think, only Phono. They had uh, one storefront dedicated only to like vintage theater gear tubes and one that was just like hardcore DIY um, and you know if you kind of just surveyed the worldwide DIY audio scene they were they had it all all in there and they had um, a demo room in the basement I went down there one time and there was this beautiful 12 inch coaxial driver playing and I was kind of struck by it and I asked them like what is this what is this driver? I don't recognize it. I could tell it wasn't a Tannoy. Uh, definitely wasn't an Altec 604, which I have a lot of experience with. But it had a lot of the character of an Altec 604, which is kind of what struck me about it. And they explained that it's, uh, it's a long-standing JBL model that is intended for high-quality commercial installation use as an in-ceiling speaker. Mm -hmm. But as I think they put it, the specs are very good and the sound is very beautiful. Um, and I just kind of took note. I took probably a physical note, you know, JBL 322C, what is this thing I need to learn about it? Um, I came home and I built a bunch of speakers over the last, you know, I probably found that driver more than 10 years ago. Experimented with it a bunch, liked it never really made it into like a big part. I never felt like it was a, maybe a big part of my, uh, of what I was trying to do, but I liked it a lot. Then when I started trying to figure out how to make a speaker of this, a high efficiency speaker of this scale, I kind of went through the high end pro audio drivers, listened to all of them in a one, roughly one cubic foot box. I wasn't wowed by anything. And I kind of whimsically thought, I wonder what the eight inch version of the 322C sounds like. I'm pretty sure there is one. So uh, I ordered the driver and it was just the first 30 seconds of the first song. You know, it's one of those experiences where you're like, this is the one that I've been looking for. Like it's got, um, it's got this classic JBL sonic character to it um, and super efficient, high nineties, uh, you know, works great with the, Flea power amps I drive my big high efficiency speakers with and uh, I over the next like year or so of building around it and also introducing the kit I had actually introduced the kit I hadn't had other people had listened to it and gave me some strong positive feedback but you know I didn't really feel like I had a lot of validation on this concept. I felt quite the confident kit, the about kit it. Props. No, just the driver in oh, general. Driver you know, itself. like you, you just. Uh, I felt strongly that it was it 
Just for the back part. It had, uh, it encompassed my sound. Okay. But um, I was just hoping that other people would, would agree with me. And uh, more and more people heard it, more and more people liked it. And I eventually did start finding references to this driver in the Japanese audio press through going through all these old, uh, that was the first place I found it, going through some issue of MJ from, I think, the early 90s. And um, flipping through, and I just see, like, I catch a, a glimpse of it. And I was like, oh, what are these guys? talking about and so it's actually in I think a, some uh, Western Electric issue of Stereo Sounds they have an 8 inch full range driver shootout and there might be one or two coaxials but the 755A and uh, the Philips 8 inch full range and you know all these kind of iconic 8 inch full range drivers and they reviewed it and I translated the article and they were speaking very favorably about the musicality of the driver and that was the first place where I was like, okay, I'm not like, this is, this is really a, mm. a very special driver. Um, so yeah, so I knew that I, I, I had developed this speaker model and that this would be kind of the one that we would do the DIY product with. Um, and so we started prototyping the kit. Um, and we, uh, I also have a close friend and collaborator who is a very influential guy in the world of um, men's fashion and fine art and design in general. Uh, his name is Virgil Abloh. He is um, sort of a titan of, I mean, he is like a mega star in the world of men's fashion. Um, and he and I have been friends and collaborators for, for a, a long time. And um, he has also been a strong supporter of my audio work over the years. So he kind of like caught wind that I was going to do this DIY thing. He said, um, let me host it on my art site. He has this website that is, um, it's called Canary Yellow. And uh, he pretty much uses it to uh, archive and also sell his like non-branded product. He's the artistic director of Louis Vuitton for, for men. He also has a really popular brand called Off-White, but then he does a lot of other stuff, which is just like, you know, projects with his friends, uh, fine artwork that he does. Uh, he has a, a traveling retrospective that's coming to the Brooklyn Museum soon, I don't know exactly when, um, called Figures of Speech, and it's just like kind of his creative retrospective. And he actually has a speaker system of mine that travels in that show, which is a total, was a total like uh, amazing experience <laughs> going to Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago and seeing a little wall plaque. You know, that's you know, you referenced me earlier as being an artist. I don't really consider myself a fine artist, but that's that moment where you're like, wow, I have my name on the wall in a museum. Yeah. It's amazing. So he's he's a strong supporter of mine. He said, let's sell these things on Canary Yellow. Um, so we kind of created like the Ogis department within the Canary Yellow site. Uh, which is at, hosted at ogis.nyc and that's where we sold the kit product and but you're still selling we're, we're still selling but initially we just kind of opened it up as like a pre-order thing okay. and um, we, we we cut it off at some point uh, the, the orders came in really quickly for the first like day and then we just kind of like capped it yeah. and we had nothing else to do so it was great but it took us like two months to produce, pack, and ship those all those orders. Mm. Not to say that it was like an insane number of them, but we're a tiny operation. Mm. We're just one small shop, two or three guys working there. And and you know, we were trying not to staff up because it was the pandemic and no one was, you know, doing that. Um, so it was overwhelming, but it was a welcome, overwhelming thing that happened at that time. But now, you know, we have a lot of these commissioned large scale speaker orders and we can't just, you know, maybe I should have a dedicated team of guys just doing this. But so now what we do is we'll produce while we can uh, produce maybe, you know, 10 pair of kits at a time, 10, 10 kits at a time. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we'll get 20 or 30 on the shelf and then we'll do like a drop. Oh, okay. Um, and those tend to sell out very quickly. 
Um, but for people who are watching this video, um, what, what do you think? How, how should we approach that? Anybody interested? Yeah, I mean, um, go to ogis.nyc. There are some on there right now. Mm. Uh, okay. I assume that they will probably sell out if, uh, if, if I posted about it, I'd probably sell them. But follow me on Instagram. Um, you know, not, not to plug myself on Instagram, but um, Devin Ogis is my Instagram, and that's basically where I communicate with people. Okay. Um, so for the most part, that's how we do the drops. You know, I'll say tomorrow at 11 a.m., and it almost never is at the time I say it's going to be. <laughs> we're going to have some kits available, and then that's how people know to like go to the site and try to get them then. The Horn Mod is, yeah. um, is, is, a, is a super fun thing that we just sort of started doing. Um, I say super fun because I think it's like starting to take this project into like a deeper level of hands-on do-it-yourselfness okay. because you are actually modifying the speaker that you've already built. Uh, well, the original DIY speaker kit was designed to be really um, absolutely no experience or tools necessary to build it. Um, I've seen people build it with like their 12 year old daughter. Oh, wait, wait. But I think I just had a little mo light bulb moment. Okay. So the original kit is just the box part. Correct. Ah, see, that wasn't. Yeah. This is the original kit okay. with the coaxial driver. Right. So most of the people that have the speaker right. are listening to just this super simple box Got it. Okay. with the coaxial driver and the port, obviously. This is sort of a slot loaded bass reflex. People generally know my work as being this like explicitly horn thing. Right. I'm very passionate about horns, as is quite obvious. Um, and so I started thinking about, okay, well, you know, I'm, I love the speaker, I'm passionate about the speaker. You know, what else can we do with, the, with this speaker? And, um, you know, the idea of adding a bigger horn with more controlled directivity, a little bit more efficiency. Um, it's, it was appealing. I at least wanted to try it. So I sort of started down this um, path of kind of trying to take the existing high frequency compression driver off the back of the coaxial, which is just yeah. this just part, that part here. Okay. I'm calling it a compression driver. JBL calls it a compression driver. Um, a compression driver snob might call it like a dome tweeter. <laughs> um, but it's a compression driver. There's okay. a little compression chamber and a phase plug and, um, you know, it loads a horn. On the coaxial, it's actually just sitting in a little, like, hole and this bracket just holds it in place yeah, with yeah, pressure. Yeah. Right. So you take off this bracket and it just falls, falls out of the back. I and I started experimenting with different horns, anything that I could really put this driver yes, on. Yes, yes, right. And then would fit reasonably well on this cabinet. Um, and I tried a bunch of different things and eventually found this really obscure JBL part that's this waveguide that was actually designed to work with the compression driver. Um, and it sounds beautiful. It, the, the driver just screws onto it as it was intended to. We, we still use the existing crossover, but we add an L pad between the crossover and the compression driver, um, which is a, a variable attenuator so right. that people can, yeah. so a volume control for the compression driver, so that people can um, tune the speaker to their room, to their preferences, but also account for the added efficiency of this horn. So I, I got this quote from that you said in one of your interviews. You talked about uh, that you said you 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 want to be the music to be in the room, in the listening room, as opposed to an audiophile approach would be more like you're listening into the recording, into the room of the recording itself. Mm. And I think that's a really interesting distinction. And you know, it's funny how describing sound with words can really be helpful because it's out there for everyone to hear on their own. But when you put it into words and, you, and you say, yeah, that, that is, I've heard it both ways. Yeah, definitely. And, that, and hearing the sound in the listening sessions we did here, in this listening session for today, hearing the sound of the music in this room 
was was very very present in the best possible way. It's it's that presence that I that I describe. Yeah. You know, it's like um, I mean, a lot of people also their first uh, their first response is it's like being at a show. You know, it's it's mm -hmm. got a very it's got a live sound. You know, and when you're in most situations where you're listening to to music in any kind of venue, there's sound reinforcement. Uh, you know, you're listening to live music, but it's on a sound system. And there are certain like f very physical qualities to to that sound that differ from like a hi-fi, like a typical hi-fi kind of sound as well. So that's that's another thing that people often say is like, wow, it, it sounds like um, you know like the best form of like being at a at a live show. Mm. But there's there's that sort of like that sense that you get in a venue where you're in this now. even if you're sitting in the audience and you're looking at a stage right. the room is just charged with a level of pressure that is so tangible you know that you feel in your clothes even you're not you're not feeling bass but there's something about like a big presentation of sound that's just different than you know listening on a small scale right. smaller scale sound system right. yeah i think that's true for like horn speakers in general yeah you know? uh the clipses that i live with every day yeah that's one of the big appeals for me is that that charged quality of uh to me there's this this illusion that you're you're breathing the same air as the performers mm -hmm. right that they are in this space and you close your eyes and you're listening to, to coltrane and it's like so charge it's that, that thing of actually hearing live music but mm -hmm. you know i think the thing the problem with saying live music nowadays is it is coming through a sound system mm -hmm. it's not the musicians on stage that you're hearing you're hearing their sound through this system right yeah i i agree that there's that horn speakers get you as close to that as i mean but Recorded music is still recorded music, right? Like yeah. it's there's some degree of, of processing that happens. Usually a lot. <laughs> there, yes, but there's always at least some, you right. know. And uh, and I don't know. I mean, um, you know, in the room, the 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 musicians in the room, that's a very real sensation that you can get, especially I think from from bigger horn loaded type speakers, but. A real instrument. Uh, there's always you can always tell when there's like a real saxophone playing <laughs> over oh, yes. there. Yeah. I mean, and it, 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 part of that is just that like the music is uh, that there's absolutely no production in it. I don't, I don't know exactly. Yeah. I'm, I'm not quite articulating this right, but um, we get as close as we can. Yeah. And 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 I do think you know, and you you commented on having heard me say this at some point that um, you know that the as beautiful as an acoustic instrument sounds right in front of you the presentation of a labored over recorded mixed and mastered album is the masterpiece hmm. right that's what the artist puts the most energy into is like composing, recording, mixing, mastering, and releasing that music. That's the end product. Right. That's the perfected version. That's a perfected version. Um, and uh, so that's what I want to. That's what I want to listen to. Mm. Okay, friends. Uh, my guest today uh, is and was Devin from Ojas and. This was this was so much fun. I really appreciate your time. I kind of definitely want to hear more of your speakers in the coming. Well, hopefully in twenty twenty two, since we're almost there. Yep. And uh, and as for you guys uh, watching, thank you for watching this far into this uh, interview. And uh, well, my name is Steve Guttenberg, and this is the Audiophiliac Show. And uh, hope you come back real soon. Bye bye. Huge Thanks. honor. Thank you so much, Steve. This oh. is a huge thrill for me as well. Well, I had a great time.